All right, guys. We're just about ready to start up here. We've got about a half a minute, a minute. We've got some people in. All right, you're all going to help me out, by the way. We play a little practical joke. Uh, whoever walks in, in one of these two doors five minutes late to this thing, what we do is uh, go, all right, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Hope to see you in the booth. Thank you. And then I want you guys to be like, woohoo, and applaud. That'll be in the first five minutes. And whoever that person going to be confused. Works every time. All right. I think we're good to start up here. The one thing I don't like about these rooms is the fact that they're so spread out here. And there's tons of seats. And the other thing is these really bright lights in the back. So hopefully uh, you're here for the designing for cloud security. That was the topic. Or how to move to the cloud and keep security at the forefront. So we actually have two things within this. And I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all slides, but we'll make sure that everybody gets the slides. Uh, the first piece is going to be from the security aspect. Uh, what's moving to the cloud? Where are seeing organizations move to the cloud? What uh, are the typical offerings? We're not going to go into vendors per se, but we are going to talk about the different lines and where organizations are going from a, a cloud first perspective on the security side. And then the second piece of this is for organizations, uh, which is almost everybody these days, uh, that are, have that, that cloud first approach and requirement, uh, they, in a lot of cases, still need to migrate some of the on-prem aspects to the cloud. And we have some uh, migration path specific data uh, and steps and approaches. Uh, the result, of course, is now we've got like a 30-something slide deck, page slide deck, and we're probably not going to hit everything within it. Uh, the goal is uh, we're going to do a little bit of a mix and match. So I'm Todd Rossin, uh, CEO, Chief Strategist, IDMWorks, and we've got uh, Nate here is going to introduce himself as well. Hi, uh, Nate Weiss, IDMWorks. I'm VP of Sales for the East and also the founder of our data center practice. So what we're going to do is have a little bit of a delineation between the security aspect and that migration approach aspect so that we can cover both. All right. Having said that, um, knowing that this one's about 50 minutes as well, we're going to try to get to all that from a topic perspective. We're going to make ourselves available after. You can also come to the booth. It's very easy to find us uh, when you go to the expo, look for the guy screaming out loud, RDM works, and he looks like Gene Simmons. We're going to pretend whether he is or he isn't Gene Simmons. OK, so having said that, first, the quick slide. We're only going to spend maybe about 20, 30, 40 seconds uh, on this one at most, just so you guys get an idea of who we are. Um, long story short, we've been around since 04, full life cycle on the IAM side of things. Uh, everything from the project perspective to operations, MSP uh, support, as well as custom solutions. And there's even more to it, but I'm not here to sell you. It's just so you understand who we are. That's all I want to do there. All right. So first, we're going to talk about cloud design, the challenges that we see. Uh, this is the first one that's twofold. Uh, there is the security aspect of it, but there's also the migration path aspect of this. So we're going to speak briefly to uh, the challenges. I want to make two things, though, really quick uh, uh, from a clarity point of view. One, you can have these slides. Uh, you're going to probably get a copy <coughs> from uh, the show, but we actually offer up uh, additional slides that we aren't able to put into our presentation. So if you guys shoot us an email, uh, it's very easy. It's going to be todd at idmworks.com and make the uh, request. We'll send you the expanded version as well as some of the other ones that we've uh, used uh, for the other five presentations that we've done this week. So the last slide, if we get to it, we'll have Todd at idmworks.com on it. Otherwise, you can come up and get one of our business cards. It's on there as well. Uh, and alternatively, again, stop by Gene Simmons at the booth there and score a picture and a Gene Simmons duck while you're at it. All right, so getting into the challenges. This is the fun part. This is the easy slide for us. There's two versions of this one I'll show you real quick. We've got this one, and we've got the expanded version of this one. If it works, there we go. We're going to go back one, though, and start from there. That's why. Come on. Hey. hey. Uh, challenges when we're moving to the cloud. We already talked uh, from a security point of view, but also from a migration point of view. Uh, number one, do we fully understand what it is that we're being asked to do? This one seems like it would be such basic uh, uh, from a logical approach 
uh, thing that you know would make sense, but I want you to understand that that was the final one, and, and, and I appreciate you guys coming. So thank you very much. Just make sure uh, you stop by the booth. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, you think he, he, I don't know if he bought it. I didn't Did worry. you buy that one? Yeah. All right. Yes, Anyways. it was better. <clears throat> All right. So again, uh, to go back to this, the, what are we actually being asked to do? It's kind of incredible uh, when we get the question, well, we take a cloud-first approach, and we go, great. What does that mean? <coughs> and the, sometimes just the, the, the blank looks that we get on people's faces. Well, you know, at the C-level suite, they're asking us or telling us we are now cloud first, but they can't explain what that means. Does it mean they're going to only look at cloud solutions from here on out? Or are they looking to actually migrate from where they are today into the cloud, right? For infrastructure, for platform, SaaS solutions. What different aspects do they mean? And a lot of the customer base has trouble explaining that. Now, in a lot of cases, you'd be surprised. You have what's in your mind on it, but it may be as simple as, no, we just want SaaS solutions only. OK, well, that doesn't really deal with the infrastructure and the platform side outside of that, because that's fully hosted. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But the point being that not only do we see a lot of uncertainty about what exactly it is, that they're looking for, and we have a great slide on that one coming up to go through the, the delineations. But when we're talking about a cloud-first approach, do we even know if we can support the model? And right now, the belief for a lot of orgs is, well, if it's SaaS, they're taking care of it. We don't have much to do. And then we, so we get into the infrastructure side and say, well, if you're doing IaaS, you do have some things you're on the hook for if you're doing Platform, maybe a little bit less, but you still have things that you're on the hook for. Do you know how to support them? Do you have, uh, from a cloud architecture point of view, the background in that? Do you have the ability to support these things? And even from a SaaS perspective, just because it's all SaaS, there are some things from a security aspect you're going to have to deal with. Who's got the credentials? Are you using your credentials? and? trying to integrate, or are you just having a separate credential set? Because if you are, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get complaints from people saying, oh, i got a whole other set of credentials to manage. And it doesn't follow any of our policies, so security has gone right out the window. All right, so we're going to keep going with that. So from that risk perspective of moving to the cloud, if we do this process and we fail, what happens? Well, it's not just our jobs on the line. Our brand as an organization may hurt. Nobody likes to lose from a financial aspect. Heads will roll. And then there's the security piece. A lot of organizations went cloud first and never thought of security, and then can't figure out why things either go down, get breached. The other aspect of that is what we tend to find is from a risk perspective, there is a belief from the C-level suite that simply moving to the cloud moves the risk to the cloud. Because if that's where a breach occurs or some other issue, they think it's as simple as pointing the finger of blame, but it doesn't work so well that way. Everything comes back around. And if your brand gets hurt as a result, you can point the finger at your provider all you want. It's your brand that took the damage. All right. Last aspect of that is, if you have not done your due diligence, and when we get to the Nate piece of this, he's going to speak to that from a, uh, a vendor perspective of data center, et cetera, from private versus public, et cetera, that there's, there's a lot of gotchas in there you have to be careful of. All right. Do we know what we're going to do? Or excuse me, what we are going to move to the cloud. Now, again, this is going to be to the double faceted here. Um, there's going to be from the internal perspective that Nate's going to hit, but also from a security perspective, we're going to talk from uh, IAM and IGA approach, those aspects of what's available in the cloud and versus on-prem versus cloud. All right. Do we understand the costs associated with moving and supporting the cloud structure? Uh, Nate's also going to have a bit on that one, but I also love this one. Uh, anyone here have to deal with uh, AWS and uh, people having uh, instances left, right, and center? 
open? Anybody have the fun part of uh, seeing that bill and going, what the heck? Why did this one server that nobody's using uh, stay on? And yeah, uh, the cloud bill. That's kind of the biggest headache, uh, in my humble opinion, outside of security, is when you get hit with that bill and you go, I thought this thing was going to be cheaper. So making sure that instances, when you're talking about from an infrastructure side, are shut down properly because the costs, not just from a migration approach, can get very big very fast and unexpectedly. And when your budget gets hit and everybody wants to murder you, you get to feel the pain. All right. Can we do this ourselves? That's the fun one. Uh, kind of hit this one uh, earlier. Uh, the migration piece is where it gets very tricky. I get to point to him every time I say that. <laughs> and then. If we are going to do it ourselves, how are we going to do this? What are the steps? This guy again. All right. This is the expanded version of everything I just said. We don't need to spend the time on it. Kept it in because you're going to want a copy at the end. All right. So first, uh, as stated, I wanted to talk about where enterprise identity and access management capabilities fit in. And this is where I get to have a little fun with some of these slides. This is my favorite one. SAS? Pass? My I ass. Where does IAM fit into all of this? Well, so again, we've spoken about the identity as a service aspect, platform as a service, and software as a service. And it's basically, uh, if you would, uh, uh, like climbing a mountain. Uh, as you progress from left to right, more is taken on by the service provider that you have. Less is on your shoulders. However, you still have to deal with security aspects of this, because you can't assume that your vendor has this lockdown. There's a lot of what ifs, a lot of gotchas. You have to make sure that redundancy is in place. Failover, you have a, a critical role in this. I'm not going to go over the definitions, because you probably don't want me to read this to you. Hopefully, uh, walking in here, uh, you have some idea of uh, infrastructure versus platform versus SaaS. If not, we can spend some time on that or come to us right after this and we'll talk through it because I only got, what, 30-something slides here? Um, as far as from an IAM perspective, things are actually changing a bit. Um, we have some of the tried and true key offerings that you see out there, identity as a service, uh, where that comes into play. So the ability to go uh, beyond uh, single sign-on from that functionality to what is a, a, an inclusive just-in-time provisioning model, so to allow us to create accounts uh, on the fly uh, as well as have our authentication and hopefully from an authorization standpoint taken care of as well. Those accounts may be within your own infrastructure or something that you set up separately. Uh, so if it's from a customer perspective, it's for uh, uh, another method of BYOD uh, from almost a portal approach. Uh, you have a lot of options there. Uh, we don't put that in in this top layer because it's really for us and, and really, hopefully for you, essentially an add-on component when you're talking about cloud services. It really falls more under SaaS. Next up, uh, CASB, and there's others which we're going to talk about shortly, bless you. Uh, from a CASB perspective, uh, Here's uh, what we're seeing as the rub. A lot of organizations, as they've moved to this cloud-first approach, they're not extending their policies to the cloud. What do you do internally for data access governance? What do you do internally for DLP? And others, as uh, I'll show you in just a moment. Well, a lot of organizations prior to looking at CASB solutions are going more of a proxy model. And that doesn't actually hit any of this. It just gives you typically a, a single point, a single barrier. However, the CASB solutions, although they're still <coughs> up and coming, and I'm sure if anybody's done them, had their, their fair share of headaches with them, they're getting better quickly. There are a lot of options out there to support, again, extending these policies, adding DLP for your cloud solutions, adding data access governance for your cloud solutions, adding some of the other bits and pieces to your event monitoring and information gathering and the like. And then other IAM tools, as I'm sure if you've hit the expo floor, that are more and more and more going cloud. Now, these days, 
everybody's pushing for a cloud instance. And one of the headaches, especially I know on the IAM side, is a lot of the legacy vendors just aren't there and they're moving there or they're trying to force you there. And they're newer technologies for them, even though they've had IAM capabilities, some of these guys going back 15, almost 20 years or more. And that's when you've seen this shift in the paradigm a couple years back um, to those guys kind of getting a little left behind in the dust, you know, in, in, in the past, I should say. And they're getting there as well and playing catch up. So let's talk about some of the tool sets and, and where does this fit in. Come on. There we go. Well, so last one actually before I hit uh, the jellyfish slides, which some of you may have seen from some of our other presentations. But when you're taking this approach, always go with our friendly people process technology. Um, everybody says this term. I always tell people, if somebody tells you, oh yeah, we people process technology, say, oh great, what do you mean by that? Watch how many blank faces you get. If they can't explain it to you, you know they're full of something. All right, having said that, let's talk about how we see it, at least from an IAM perspective. I'm gonna start with IAM um, and, and how that obviously will apply to the cloud will hopefully become evident very quickly. Uh, I've said this in, in prior um, sessions that we've done, which were actually all of them yesterday, all five of them that we had. So from a, a people and process perspective, we start. Start with the process first, right? If our processes are broken, if our processes are not in good shape, you go to the technology side, which includes the cloud aspect, moving to a cloud first or moving to the cloud in any way, shape, or form, or picking a cloud technology, you are going to fail. And by failure, I don't mean you're not gonna be able to move to the cloud, but your process is gonna be broken. So what you're gonna get is a lousy version of it. And what I mean is this, if right now your process is Pick your poison, but A then goes to B, then goes to C, then drops down to N, comes back up to E, we skip D altogether, we have a broken process. And if that's what's going on right now, we need to fix that first. And if after E, it goes to asterisk, because it's what's in Nate's head, and then it goes to double asterisk, it's what's in Steve's head, here's the problem. We got a people problem, and that knowledge walks out the door at some point too. And a lot of organizations think, well, we're moving to a cloud-first model. That'll be taken care of. No, if it's broken up front, it's broken there as well. Same goes for your data. If your data is bad, we've got duplicates here. We've got nested groups over here. And we have no idea what the heck goes to what. We don't have any tracking. We've got empty things here and so on and so forth. If our data is bad, we're in just as bad a shape, and we go to move and we got the same problem because all the technology in the world does not help if your data is bad and your process is bad because technology will just give you a faster version of crappy process and lousy data. So we gotta avoid that. So first and foremost, we have to take an approach of fixing things, cleaning things, getting it where it needs to be before we move. Otherwise, it all goes out the window. And from a security perspective, you're gonna get hit very hard. The other piece of this I always tell people is do not buy any of these guys' technology. And the sales guys out there uh, from the vendors, uh, they always give me that look of death, which is why I'm glad we got the bright lights here right now. <laughs> Don't buy their tech because you need to fix this first. If it's not ready to go and you don't understand what those processes are, how do you know what you need? How do you understand what are my requirements going forward? What and how does this play into the future from a roadmap and a blueprint, if you would, perspective? And if we don't have our ducks in a row, I guess is the best way to put it, that technology you're going to buy is either not going to be used or you're only going to use 10%, 20%, whatever that magic percentage is. I think the, uh, what's the industry average when they, uh, somebody buys software? I think it's like uh, they use about 32% of the functionality just so you understand, that is, is a really good number, and I'll tell you why, because 87.9% of all statistics, completely made up. <laughs> so let's talk about, from the IAM perspective piece of the security, what it is that we're gonna be hitting. 
Now, again, I know we're IAMIGA, and that's really where we come into fold in this, but it's expanding, right? CASB's falling under that now as well, uh, and it expands out from there. So first, what's the end goal from that perspective? Well, we want to make sure the right people get the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, and we have to be able to prove it. And that doesn't change when we move to the cloud, and it really doesn't change for most IT security paradigms. If I can't tell you right now that it's kernel mustard with the candlestick in the library, I'm doing something wrong. And you know who's going to tell us first? Your auditors. And if we have regulations that we must follow, California Privacy Act's a good one, uh, GDPR, uh, and more and more that are coming, as well as this, the old standards of SOX and HIPAA, et cetera, we have a big problem. So what we want to make sure that we're covering in this process, one, administration, how are we handling the identities? Does it change in a cloud model? Oh, no, it does not. And we say identities and their entitlements, it's really an entity approach. Why is this? It's not just humans, right? Non-humans as well. You're going to see in my next slide when we talk about what is out there from a cloud offering perspective, the privilege side of things as well, non-human accounts. So uh, robotics, so our friend bots, system accounts, server and service accounts, the things that humans don't necessarily need to touch. Or if they are, that's another problem. So having said that, the entities and everything around them from an entitlement perspective, which gets us to the next one, access. And this is the big bad boy when it comes to the cloud side, as well as the consumer side for that matter, which is access, auth and auth C. Authentication, how do I get in? And then once I'm there, what am I allowed to do? And a lot of the organizations out there are struggling with this one from a cloud perspective. And when we say this from a design perspective, there's a lot of groups out there that are still saying, well, that application has its own login. It's got its own setup. Maybe you've got multi-factor on it, and even then it's something different. It's whatever's offered out there. And that's problematic. If you can't extend your credential set to that, uh, or, or assert, I should say, at a minimum, or enforce this with multi-factor, what you're doing is saying, I'm moving to the latest, greatest, newest stuff out there, but I'm taking a step back from security. I'm making our security worse by actually moving to the cloud. That's problematic as well. So if you can't integrate your security, A, you have a problem, because you better figure out why. And then B, if it's the provider, well, then you need to slap some provider out there or change your provider. All right, the last piece of that, of course, is the intelligence, the audit, the analytics. This goes back to the logging and the reporting mechanisms within. This should not change because you've moved to the cloud. If you have right now uh, a SIM, whether it's uh, uh, outsourced or on-prem, and you're able to track notify and manage information and events, and you can't expand that to your cloud offerings, what are you doing? You're taking a big step back again from security. Now, this is why uh, CASB solutions are pushing into that, but also a lot of the SIM solutions as well, which is going to get me to our fun next slide. So we took that thing. Ah, you know, I skipped one thing. I call it the jellyfish. Did I say that earlier? I'm, this is my third one talking about the jellyfish or fourth. He's going to take a picture. You can have a copy of this, I promise. Um, I got to go back for one second. OK, we call this one the jellyfish. Do you know why we call this the jellyfish? Not because it's a circle. Because when you look at a jellyfish from the top, it looks pretty basic. Then you turn it on its slide. And that's the thing I wanted to say. And boom. Wow, we got a lot of things to cover in this process. So now when we're designing, have you looked at all of these things? Some of them may just be a checkbox. Uh, yeah, we don't need it, or it doesn't apply to us. But if you're not covering everything within identity and access management from that security perspective, when you are moving to cloud first, or moving to the cloud, I should say, you're missing something big. OK, I could run through each every one of these, uh, but I'm going to try to take it from a lighter approach, why I'm bringing this up. First, uh, we already talked about SIM, so I'm not going to spend anything more to say than, again, offerings available for your cloud offerings, both in the cloud as well as 
standard on-prem that will manage this for your cloud environments? Yes, they exist. You should be looking at that. SOD, our friend, segregation of duties as well. Can we move our model that we use inside internally, our um, policies, to support your cloud, your cloud instances, infrastructure, platform, and obviously applications? And the answer is very succinctly yes. There's a number of vendors right now out on the expo floor that can support this. The real question is, should I? And people say that. And the very simple <coughs> answer to that is yes. And I'll tell you, it's simply because if you're doing it today, you need to be doing it tomorrow. Just because you're moving to cloud does not allow you to take a step back from it. Same thing goes with the lifecycle management. We talked about how, uh, for example, from identity as a service. Well, the tricky part, of course, with identity as a service is they're typically not as robust as what you have on-prem, but they're catching up very quickly. So you may have a mixed model, or you may have an approach that includes private data center as well as, so uh, you may have private cloud, public cloud, hybrid in between. So even the current on-prem systems have an expanded life beyond just shoving them out somewhere, replacing them with a uh, cloud-only version. You don't necessarily need to do that because they can still support your cloud offerings. And they may actually, some of the cloud offerings, not be as robust as the current, uh, what are considered to be on-prem mechanisms. So you have to make sure that if you're moving to a cloud offering of the same type of solution that you currently have, that you do have an apples to apples comparison for functionality. If those offerings don't, you're taking a step back again. All right. Uh, let me jump around a little. I talked about role that would fit into it, role management. Uh, authentication, we're gonna go into authentication because I'm gonna run out of time, believe it or not, otherwise. Um, we briefly hit on this one again. Uh, are we able to integrate security solutions from an authentication standpoint to those offerings? And at this point, the majority of the offerings out there allow you to utilize what you have or what you choose from a credentialing perspective, whether it's something internal, whether you're using something uh, external like an open ID um, or even from a federated perspective, there are almost every one of the solutions, I say almost, because it's not everybody that uh, supports uh, full integration across all platforms. So you have to do a little bit of studying on that one when you're looking at a solution to make sure they can. And if they can't, you may have to cross them off the list. Or you may actually have to upgrade what you're doing from an infrastructure approach. If you're way too legacy in what you're currently doing, that goes into the process uh, issue here. You have to fix that. It may be a technological solution as well, but you have to understand what are those <coughs> issues, what's holding you back, and account for that first. As we progress through that, you'll see when we get into the authorization side, and I want to spend a minute or two on this one, uh, we have a lot there. A lot of organizations right now with their cloud-first approach, they're actually doing pretty well on the authentication side. Oh yeah, we have no problem from an authentication standpoint. People don't have to remember 18 different credentials anymore and uh, we support multi-factor. Maybe we have adaptive authentication as well so that we know if it's something a little more on the critical side, it asks you for yet another factor or asks you to do it again or whatever the rule behind it is. Where a lot of organizations are breaking down are on the authorization side. They're either, bless you, having that integration from an authentication standpoint, bless you again, or what's happening is they're doing that, but they still have some kind of backend account or profile, and that's where these things are getting set from a uh, 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 entitlements perspective. And where it gets ugly is if there has to be some kind of account synchronization there in order to do that. And I know a lot of orgs still have that on-prem. I'll have an application here. Sure, I can use my AD credentials there, but then I still have to create a separate account there, and I have to do a whole bunch of synchronizations on the back end. Not good, because that's where things break down. And anytime you have to do any kind of synchronization, uh, I could probably do a show of hands, and I'll bet you I'll get a lot of them. Um, anybody here have that wonderful headache where somebody changes, uh, uh, let's just say, a password in your internal network, or they do it off of their mobile device, and now they got to call the help desk because nothing's working, because there's a latency problem, because the synchronization hasn't happened yet? 
I see nodding heads, so we'll do it from that. Well, that's why from an authorization perspective, you need to take a look at what those options are as well. You don't necessarily need to externalize your authorization, although that is an option, but you have to have a methodology at a minimum in place to avoid constant synchronization. Because if I have to keep things synchronized here and other aspects of our environment don't know what that is, don't have any insight into it, we don't have any real traceability, we run into the same issue. All right, privileged account management, and you'll see it under elevated. This is the other one. There are actually offerings that are uh, SaaS-based, and this one is kind of interesting to me because it took a while for people to really start taking them seriously because people are like, I'm going to put my key to the kingdom accounts up in the cloud? And there's a lot of fear there. Uh, typically, we see a, a, a mixed mode. As you move to that, you still have some kind of on-prem presence as a backup plan because if that gets cut and you can't get the things, you got a headache on your hands. So that's the typical model that we see out there. But what's good about it is that model now supports the ability to primarily have a cloud-first approach. Some are cloud only. You can make the determination if that makes sense for your organization on that one. And what I don't have here is RPA, because that one gets interesting as well, because as you put bots into the mix, Hopefully, your PAM solution is integrated there as well. And if it's cloud-based, you need to double check that that's a functionality that's either there or on their roadmap as well, because more and more organizations are moving into bot world. And what's interesting there as well is some are a couple hundred and some are already into the tens of thousands. All right. Content management, DLP, from that perspective, we talked about that. Can your solution? extend what you're doing from a DLP and the next one under it, the data access governance to the cloud. Uh, that's where you see a lot on the CASB side of things as, uh, as an option, though not the only option. So cloud offering perspectives. All of these and everything you see here, you need to, from a checklist approach, see how they apply to you. Because as you're moving, if the answer is they don't apply, OK. Uh, if they do, you better make sure that your offerings that are out there are supporting this. And if they're not, you're, again, last time I'll try to say this one, taking a step back from your current security model. Well, why would you do that? Cloud first is great, but if I drop security off the map, why? Is that really a, a, a boon to us? All right, so how do we design this? I'm going to hand over to Nate, let him start talking for a bit. Thank you, sir. And I'll apologize up front for my voice, cigars, lack of sleep, and public speaking do not mix. <laughs> so um, start with a show of hands. Um, how many of you are leveraging either Azure or AWS in your own environments? OK. And how many of you have on-prem data centers, be it production, DR? So a lot of the same hands. So <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, uh, I had started a data center practice at IDM Works back in 2010. And what I'm going to talk about today is the process that we have that is something that can be utilized by all of the customers, prospects, and users out there um, that are going down this, this cloud journey. Um, the experience that we have and, and, and some of the tools I'm going to talk to you about um, tie in what we've seen people doing from an adoption perspective. Uh, Percentage-wise, I'm going to say I saw roughly 85, 90% of the room raise their hands, leveraging some form of public cloud. It's about what we're seeing today. Uh, we still see a, a large footprint of on-prem services. So a lot of the hybrid models uh, are what we're seeing. One thing that doesn't change is the steps that you have to take in order to plan for these migrations document what you're going to be doing with these, these, these migrations. And all of that then ties back into Todd's conversation about the types of tools that you have to have in place and sticks along with the same trend you've probably heard in a lot of these uh, presentations, which is plan, 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 right? Um, measure twice, cut once uh, from an execution perspective. Um, so we're going to talk about, there we go, uh, four-step process that, that we have rolled out. Uh, it's assess, building roadmaps, migration, and manage. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the tools that are out there and the way in which they're leveraged and some of the information that's provided. As so we talk about the information that's gathered through the use of some of these, these, uh, these tools in the market and this approach, 
uh, again, you'll be able to tie it back into some of the things that, uh, that have been covered earlier. So a lot of times you go into organizations, talk about, let's talk about the assets that you have. Let's talk about the inventory. We're talking now about things like servers, virtual, physical. Um, we're talking about network. We're talking about firewalls. Anything that is comprised to build that, that data center, again, on-prem or, or something being prepared to go to the cloud. What are the application stack dependencies? So as we're doing these mappings, we're talking about what can migrate, where can it migrate, what's it a candidate for, okay? We need to understand what its dependencies are. So as we're moving things in groups, maybe it's by tiered applications or maybe it's by security groups, uh, we have the knowledge and the documentation to be able to support uh, what we're gonna be looking to accomplish. Looking at things like future state. So, Many of our customers today and many of the customers we go out and speak with when we're doing presentations, again, are already going down that path of the cloud journey. We're leveraging AWS, we're doing some low-hanging fruit, we're waiting to move into some of our larger applications. Certainly, there's some verticals like healthcare, not looking to put Epic out in the cloud. Um, there are providers that offer those types of services, so that becomes more of a, a PaaS offering. <clears throat> but there are other systems and services that uh, would fall under that tier two classification that are a little bit bigger lift, a little heavier lift, uh, that require more planning than maybe some, some lower uh, email and uh, end user type, type services. The cost. So we, we have uh, several examples of very large organizations that have gone, started their journey by a couple people saying, Hey, listen, we're going to throw some things in the cloud. I got it on my credit card here. And uh, we're going to start spinning up some servers. And we're going to just, we're going to check this out. We have one customer, we'll go unnamed, of course. Uh, their bill has climbed to $97,000 a month. We had, uh, they actually went through some of the tools that we work with on their own internally. They cut their spend down by $58,000, $60,000 based on their spend now some of those things were repurposed back on site. But that server sprawl that we used to see in data centers on-prem of I need a system, I need a service, just go add another machine, is similar to what our developers now are doing if we don't have proper governance in place with server sprawl in the cloud. Uh, it's just easier to spin something up. I don't know what's going on here. I'm not gonna go look at that. Okay, so the better documentation we have on what we're gonna be moving, how we're gonna be moving it, why we're moving it, allows us to have a greater sense of understanding as we look at some of the planning that goes into those future steps. We are definitely not getting through all these slides just for everyone's information. So uh, I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna make sure I just hit the planning part and then certainly as Todd mentioned, uh, this will be available for everyone uh, at the end of the show and we'll be up here with cards. What do these cloud readiness assessments get? Uh, device inventory, I mentioned that earlier, network dependencies, application inventories, application stack groupings. Going back, let's say a decade, uh, we would go in and talk to customers about pulling this information together, and we would be pulling information from the application team, the network team, the storage team, uh, security teams. We would work with finance, we would work with legal. You, you would be doing these manual interviews with a variety of different uh, groups within each organization didn't make a whole lot of sense, especially as things were becoming virtualized and with the tools available in the market today. Uh, so some of the applications out there will actually allow you to go out with agentless services to do auto discovery, to start to automatically and dynamically populate some of this information, which gets through the security risks of, you know, I'm putting agents on machines. But the way these technologies have been built, provide all this data we need to build that foundational layer to put those migration plans together. Uh, big one is cloud cost uh, uh, projections. So I'm going to move to the cloud because my CEO wants us to do that. I'm going to move to the cloud because I think it's going to be cheaper. I'm going to move to the cloud because it's more flexible. Sometimes those are all correct. A lot of times they're not. Uh, a lot of times people aren't really looking at the, the benefits of leveraging the cloud may be hey, I can spin up and spin down my servers, I can work with peak utilization, I can do auto scaling, I can maybe have greater ge geographic diversity, right? <clears throat> if I'm not leveraging some of those tools and I just put my same footprint in AWS, chances are the like for like isn't going to be something less expensive and depending on the tools that we have to deploy, gonna cost a lot more money, yeah, absolutely. 
So we're talking about collecting data, agentless collection, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a number of tools in the marketplace. We evaluated five or 10 of these. Uh, we found that three or four, and certainly willing to share some of those names with you, um, proved to be what we found would get through the security evaluation internally, would provide a lot of solid data. Um, again, we're starting with assets. We're looking at massive scale. These tools have been run for organizations that scale up to 10,000 servers, I think is the largest one that we've seen, um, all the way down to smaller health systems, practices, law firms, et cetera. We go out, run these agentless tools, look at this, um, uh, the amount of assets and information. We're looking at Windows, Linux, Unix, VMware. Again, probably five or six that, that, that we, could, we could refer you to. Um, we move into the next step, which is adding the intelligence. So now these tools are going out, pulling this information. We're getting it back. This is when you're going now and meeting with your application groups and saying, this looks like application X. This looks like application Y. We're now starting with all the data, right? So, so we're, not, we're not asking questions. Can you tell me about your ERP system? Can you tell me about your imaging system? Can you tell me about your back-end office support system for XYZ? Uh, we now have it, and we're having very structured, detailed meetings with our customers and or the end users being done internally to say, Here's what we have. Is this how it looks? Is this how it functions? Yes. So we're starting to, again, paint a much better picture of, of how these dependencies are all laid out. We look at client consumption by site, by location, by data center. And we have the ability then to develop cloud pricing. So these modules are tied into the latest AWS, Azure, Google, Oracle cloud pricings. So you can see by usage of by host, by application stack, by region, by zone, what these costs to run in the cloud. Real powerful tools. Um, I don't see a lot of people taking this approach, quite frankly, when we're out having conversations or doing lessons learned in forums like these. All that data that we collect during those early periods are then used to build the roadmap, tie together the migration plan. We look at the solution mapping of hybrid versus cloud versus on-prem. We utilize all this information, obviously, for updating or building our DR plan. So these are outside of the security tools we're talking about, but it's more the security process, uptime, the availability processes that obviously matter once we're changing anything about uh, the environment and or where we're hosted. I'm going to go about two more minutes, and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions. This is just a snapshot. Again, as we do these inventories, we're getting server names, IP addresses, network equipment, operating systems, CPU, RAM, power states, virtual disks. So we, we not only have the information that we use to build a plan, but we also have the information that I'm sure if you go within your organizations and you're talking to different groups, be it IT operations, infrastructure, and you say, hey, we want to talk about this stack as we're looking to make some major changes as to where we host it or different types of services we're looking at. It's going to be really difficult to get all of that information, but we need all that as we're looking to make this transition. That's also what allows us to obviously do some very good and detailed cloud cost modeling, which then helps with all the planning that we're going to be looking to do. I hate some of these already. We'll just make sure I don't leave out any. These are some visuals, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, of one of the tools um, that, that have, we've evaluated. Um, it's a visual representation on the bottom. You can see it looks like a lot of noise. Some of the graphics have changed recently. But the picture, as they always say, is worth a thousand words. That's a view of 10 different tier one applications in a customer's environment. The lines are all showing all the interdependencies between those systems. Yeah, what he's not telling you is that's a screenshot from Tempest. Did anyone remember that game in the 80s? <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> uh, so so we're, we're, we have a number of different screens here. And the important part is there's data. The data is available. Data can be used by different groups for different purposes. Security side certainly being the focus for these shows, and I have to always make sure I'm tailoring my message to that. Uh, but we're looking at things like land, WAN, segmentation, optimization. Certainly ties into security, ties into access. Uh, all these, again, tying back to the data we're collecting, the data we need for the planning to be able to execute. Just a slide on here we have for some of the projected cloud cost modeling. I made it rather generic on the bottom right there. Uh, but again, number of different solutions out there that provide the same functionality. 
And it's and it's it's interesting if you look to do this internally with your efforts. I'm sure some of you have gone through. What's it cost for me to run my environment? If you're doing internal chargebacks for certain applications, or you're doing rationalization or TCO um, um, engagements internally to get approvals, it's tough to get that info. It's tough to get it when you have an on-prem data center. You look at what's my cost per square foot, what's power cost, where am I located, what's it cost to cool a server, what's it cost to cool the network, what's it? You, you get into all that infrastructure stuff. Then you tie into the support, what are my DBAs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You go down the line, my SMEs. And if you, if you look at it from these cloud perspectives, it does put it in a little bit better of a box. And again, allow you to make some of those decisions as you're building these plans. The end of these engagements, whether being done internally through use of a tool, you know, you want to have these wave plans. You want to have a classification report. You want to see what applications are classified where. You want to build timelines. You want to see what risk we have. We want to look at reports that will show us what is not a candidate for the cloud and if not, why. This obviously is normally the biggest barrier to people looking to move things into AWS or Azure. I, I don't have enough CPU, RAM, memory. I need to rehost or replatform this application or part of this application in this stack, but it's a lot of work. It's going to be real expensive. We're going to come back to that, right? This again helps identify some of the areas that you need to focus in on and again allow you to understand once we make those transitions what those savings may be, what the cost may be, what the increase could be. Okay. This is an eye chart we won't even talk about, but this just is all the communication protocols and all different areas that generally when we get our my super techie propeller heads talking to other super techies, uh, you know, the information that they're asking around, what do you connect with, what do you speak to, what languages, et cetera. So that'll be in the presentation and certainly something you can look at. We're gonna stop at the build, there's the build run, they're the next two. Um, we have about three minutes left, so I, I won't do it justice by flying through and I'm not gonna read it. Um, but we, we have the presentation here, we can share it, I'm around before or after if any of this was relevant or exciting enough to want to talk uh, in more detail. Um, so with that, uh, questions for Todd or I? Get to the last slide. Get to the last one? Yeah, if you want. Yes. We're going to uh, jump real quick to the last slide. Uh, as as uh, uh, Nate was stating, um, we wanted to make sure that you saw the first step of the three in the assess aspect. Uh, if there's, you want to speak to this one? I just, Go ahead. This is, this is one in the... Um, in the build stage here that call your attention to and if, you, if you're interested in seeing a copy of the presentation, um, something that we discuss in, at length, <coughs> talks about the build process, the assessment that I just rambled on for uh, about for 20 minutes, um, talking about selecting the cloud provider, certainly a lot goes into that. Todd mentioned public cloud, virtual private cloud, colo, hybrid models. There's a lot of different flavors. I've spent the last 15 years dealing with those options, the benefits, the value, and things of that nature. So a lot goes into that selecting the cloud provider services, and that's ever changing. You know, the one problem we see is people feeling like they have to pick a path and going down it, and technology changes, vendors change, support changes, whatever it may be, the organization changes. Um, very important step. Get into the architect component, Estimating the costs, we hit out how important that is. Provisioning and automating the cloud services, tying in the orchestration, tying in security. Um, so I just think this is a good slide. Um, we'll, we'll come back to it at some point. Or you do. Just real yeah. quick also, just to add on, what it really comes down to is, is twofold, right? One, uh, this is a rationalization approach. As much as everyone's pushing for cloud first, sometimes it is cloud second. I know that, that may throw people off, but you have to rationalize if it truly makes sense. We spent the first half of this, uh, maybe a little bit more speaking specifically on the security aspect, ties in similarly as well as part of your rationalization, if it makes sense to. Well, I'll get back to you because we're about to run on time. So we we're quick on There's the run the slide. Yeah. Um, again, if you want to copy this with the extras, it's very simple. It's Todd at IDMWorks.com and we'll make sure to get you this, uh, the extras version out. Obviously we're available both here and at the booth to speak about the migration path uh, for Cloud First initiatives as well as the security path that uh, I started off with. And do we have any initial questions? Anybody have anything? Otherwise we're close. 
Okay, I know we hit you with a little bit of fire hose. There's uh, two different paths in this. Um, but again, we will get you this information out and we are at your beck and call at the expo today. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time.